Good morning. Uh, welcome to our ses se session. Um, my name is Olivier Tardieu. I'm a principal uh, research scientist and manager at IBM. And today I'm joined with, uh, by Abhishek Malvankar, who is a senior software developer at IBM Research. And the two of us are very excited to tell you uh, about our experience, about the lessons we learned trying to use dynamic resource allocation for improving GPU utilizations on our uh, Kubernetes clusters. So uh, in this talk, I'll start by briefly uh, talking about motivations, uh, inference servers, the, the, the workload that you know, led us on this journey toward using dynamic resource allocation. I'll talk about multi-instance GPUs, and then we'll dive into dynamic resource allocation. I'll talk about what it changes from the perspective of Kubernetes users uh, or cluster owners, and I'll introduce InstaSlice, which is a, a piece of code we're contributing to the community that is you know, paradoxically trying to make sure that nothing changes. Uh, that will become clear in a second. And after that, Abhishek will walk you through uh, not just uh, what uh, Jira is doing, but how it's working, its mechanics, and what we've been trying to do to improve on the out-of-the-box experience with scheduling latencies and placement strategies. So in the last couple of years at IBM Research, we've been developing uh, an inference server service, a large you know, inference service that I think today is ranging over about 100, hey, 100 NVIDIA GPUs. And we use this service as a platform for experimentation with models, with serving technology, and so on. And it serves a constantly varying, evolving collection of machine learning models, some of them very big, with you know, hundreds of billions of parameters, and some of them relatively small by today's standards with just, a, let's say, a couple million parameters. We've talked already twice this week about this uh, inference service. Here's one of the talk on the slides. There's another one. You, if you want more uh, specifics, more details about this workload and this service, you can find a lot more statistics in these talks. But from the purpose of these talks, what is of interest uh, to me today is that some of these models are small. They, can, uh, they only require a fraction of a GPU to run. And so, of course, in order to maximize GPU utilization, we like to uh, pack many models on uh, the same GPU. And you have different ways to go after that, but this is KubeCon. So today, we're going to talk about Kubernetes native mechanism to do that. Hi, he, how can I run multiple containers or multiple pods on a single GPU? Uh, for that, I need to introduce multi-instance GPUs, which is uh, a feature of uh, NVIDIA data center class GPUs, like A100 GPUs or H100 GPUs. Uh, essentially, it's the idea that I can divide uh, one GPU into a number of slots, seven today. And if I want to use these uh, seven slots or slices of my GPUs uh, as if they were independent devices. But I can also group them in pairs, in groups of three or four or seven, so that I can get the GPU size, if you want, that is exactly right for my workload, right? And the nice thing about uh, MIG is that I can mix and match. So I can get a two-slot uh, instance with a one-slot instance, a one-slot instance, and three-slot instance. Or I can do something completely different. What's not so convenient, though, about MIG is that this is not a, just a virtual partition of the chip. This is really about deciding what you do with physical spaces or areas on the chip. And so what that means, for instance, is if I just want a single slot and uh, I choose one in the middle or one at the end of the GPU, it will make no difference to the workload that is running on these slots. It's going to get the same amount of memory, the same amount of compute, and so on but it's actually going to dramatically change what I can do later with the remainder of the GPU because it introduces different fragmentation patterns with the GPU, right? Now, understanding this kind of resource allocation constraints and how to best make use of those is not quite something that Kubernetes resource management and scheduler can do today, which is why the community has been working on dynamic resource allocation, or one of the reasons the community has been working on dynamic allocation, resource allocation, we're going to talk about that. But um, you know, before I get there, you know, if you like me, you like Tetris. You can think of MIG as a puzzle if you want. A GPU is kind of this weirdly shaped thing, and you're trying to cover it with these weirdly shaped pieces. And you can play this game at home with your kids. 
So how does this help us? Again, I said this before, it's because if we can fit the model in a small slice, we can increase density, we can run more models on the GPU, everything is good. Of course, as you might guess, uh, performance is kind of a different story because as I reduce the size of the slice, I'm also reducing the amount of compute, the amount of memory I can use for caching, and therefore I'm kind of limiting the throughput I can get out of the model. So as a result, uh, the optimal slice for a particular model not only depends on the model size, parameters, you know, um, you know, a bit width, but also on the loads. And of course, you know, load varies over days because model popularity changes, because load, again, varies throughout the day. And so what that means is we want to do a good job at uh, uh, maximizing density while preserving our service levels uh, agreement or objectives for this service. We have to dynamically vary the size of the slice for you know, small models. And you could think of doing this as horizontal scaling by having fewer or more slices, but this is wasteful because you have to duplicate the model wastes, and it's actually, uh, in this case, vertical scaling gives better performance, and this is well, what we like to have, which is why we need a mechanism to dynamically scale, dynamically slice uh, uh, a GPUs, making changes for one particular model without necessarily affecting other models. So can you do this today with Kubernetes mainstream, you know, stable releases? Kind of, but not exactly. What, what you can do is you can deploy the NVIDIA GPU operator to your clusters. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Now, the NVIDIA GPU comes with MIG support. It comes with something called uh, MIG Manager. And what it lets you do is let an admin go and label nodes on your clusters, select a profile, a layout for your GPUs, and then when you, when you set this label or when you deploy the operator, uh, what, you will end, the, what the operator will end up doing is actually slicing the GPUs, configuring the GPUs according to the specification you provided. For instance, in that case, uh, building this kind of uh, distribution of slices on the GPU. And then uh, the uh, nodes will start advertising, matching resources. We call these things extended resources because they are not just CPU memory, and then you can request for a particular pods one of those slices by just including a resource a request or resource limits on your pod spec. Okay, so this is great. Again, what's great about it is that it just works. Um, it's uh, stable. Uh, you know, all the all the slices are available at the same time because this is a proper partitioning of the GPU. It's actually even support dynamic partitioning because an admin can come in and change the label on the nodes and the GPU operator will uh, do the rest, right? Propagating and making configuration changes on the GPUs in your cluster. What's not so great about it for use case is that there's no partial reconfiguration, no incremental reconfiguration, and it's slow. Right? So by no partial reconfiguration, what I mean is if I change this label, all my workloads on my GPU are going to be evicted, and I will need to start again. So I cannot make small, you know, limited changes on my GPU, such as merging the two green partitions into a blue one if I want. It's also no incre not incremental. You know, if I just get a single pod coming to my cluster and I need to allocate a slice on the GPUs for that pod, I need to decide ahead of time what I'm going to do with the rest of the GPU. So I need to guess what the next workload is going to need, which in general, you know, I might get wrong. And finally, when I do this, I have to wait a minute or two. If I do a reconfiguration, the way the GPU operator works is uh, it's such that I need a minute or two to actually uh, uh, go and um, observe the changes and be able to use those changes. So this is where dynamic resource allocation enters the picture, or one of the reasons it does, right? Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen the keynotes from Patrick, from uh, Kevin yesterday, and so DRA is an attempt from the communities to standardize access to on-demand resources where everything is trickier than what we're used to, right? The resource description themselves is tricky because, for instance, in the case of MID, they combine you know, valid pairs of memory footprint and compute footprint. 
they have custom satisfiability rules, right? Uh, if I want to decide whether a GPU can satisfy a resource request or not, I need to have a deep understanding of how Mix works. What are the conflicts between the different layouts of partitions on, on the GPU? There's also custom initialization and cleanup because once I decide that yes, a GPU can satisfy a request, I still have to go and configure the GPU so that it exposes exactly the device I've logically uh, you know, given my pod. So it's, it's much more than that. It's also about sharing, not just sharing by partitioning, but sharing by having two pods share the same slice and things like that. It's not just for GPUs. You know, GRA comes uh, with a concept of resource claims, and it follows from persistent volumes, persistent volume claims. So it's about storage, it's about network, it's about topology. There's a lot of potential there. Again, Kevin and Patrick have a list of 6, 10, 11, 12 use cases that you can use this for. This is great. Now, the last thing to mention about this though, is that this is an alpha feature. This has been an alpha feature for a while, and this is going to be an alpha feature for a while longer because this is really important and the community wants to get this right. So as a disclaimer, I should also say that us at IBM are eager to deploy DRA in, in lots of clusters. We are working to get there and facilitate that, but until the specification stabilizes in us, we are not going to do that yet. So. How do you use Duray? Uh, this is how you use the NVIDIA GPU operator. I've, seen, I've shown this before. The way you use Duray is you comment out these three red lines of YAML, and you replace this with the green stuff. So I know what you're going to say, but before we get there, in fairness to DRA, there's a reason for this abundance of green. Again, Duray is expressive, flexible, powerful. So we have to pay this price somewhere. Now, having said that, Ouch, right? I don't want to be having to explain to my users that the YAMLs they've been happy with for the last few years, they have to change it, uh, and they have to replace every YAML or every YAML generation tool to do the, the green instead of the red. I don't want to tell them, I don't know if I can point this, that if you look at this slide, sometimes you need a dot between 1G and 5GB, and sometimes you need a hyphen, and if you get this wrong, nothing is going to work. I really don't want to do that which is the first reasons we've been working on InstaSlice. InstaSlice, if you think of GRA as the medicine that Kubernetes needs, think of InstaSlice as the sugar coating that we need to make the medicine go down. InstaSlice is a bunch of things. Uh, Abhishek will talk about the more interesting, maybe more advanced features of InstaSlice, but to start with, it's all about making you forget the previous slide. I, you've never seen that. You never think that anything has to change, right? And the way we do this concretely is we've implemented a pod admission controller, a mutating webhook that looks for, you know, pod specs and sees a resource, MIG resource requests in these pod specs, and essentially rewrite them as the equivalent claims, right? So this is available today. This is open source. You can go, you can download it, you can run it on your cluster. You should give it a star, not because it's rocket science, not because you think deploying a pod admission controller on your cluster is a great idea, you know, the hundreds of ways you can kill your clusters and your productivity, but because together we can send a clear message to the community that these kind of user experience questions, these kind of migration questions, these are not second order concern, right? This is really something that the DRA proposal has to embrace, right? How are we going to help our user migrate from the old world to the new world. Is it something for NVIDIA to solve? Is it, you know, how do we do that? We have to discuss. But this is something we need to do. And ideally, I don't want to maintain this code for the rest of an eternity. So um, before I leave, i really like to do a demo. I think I'm running out of time. So you can go and watch this online, offline, after the talk on YouTube. I'm just going to uh, tell you briefly what you're going to find there. Um, but essentially, everything I've talked about so far. In this demo, I, oh, I'm not seeing this. Uh, let me share this. Um, I guess because. Um, can you see this now? No. Nope. It's because this is the other screen. Yes. Okay, so. What you, can, what you will find in this demo is uh, uh, essentially a demonstration of how you can create a Kubernetes cluster, how you can on this Kubernetes cluster deploy and use the NVIDIA GPU operator to slice your GPUs ahead of time. So here, you know, I'm configuring my GPUs so 
that they are uh, sliced uh, in se seven homogeneous slices of the same type. I can then deploy the workload, the thing I have on the right on the cluster. It's going to work halfway because one of the pods, uh, for one of the pods, I can satisfy the MIG request. For another one, I cannot do that because uh, the kind of slice I'm asking for is not available in the cluster, which is why we want zero in the first place. So what I do like in this demo is reconfigure the MIG operator so that you know how to do this, but more importantly, how you can instead use DRA, which uh, will then let me deploy the same workload on the cluster as is. And if I do that, if you've been following carefully, what's going to happen? Well, nothing, because DRA doesn't understand re extended resources. But finally, I can combine DRA in the slice and Eureka, I get the best of both worlds. I can use the same workloads as before. I can deploy it on my cluster. It will now run. And instead of having to create GPU slices ahead of time, I'm going to create the combination of Insta Slice and DRA will create the slices that you need, exactly the one you need, exactly when you need them. Right? That, uh, I think, concludes my part of the talk. And I'll try to bring back the PowerPoint here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Olivier. Um, so uh, definitely, Olivier took us through a journey of uh, the the device plugin way or the GPU operator way of doing things, and then now um, we drop down to uh, the DRA, which is uh, certainly the new way um, of doing things. Uh, so let's learn. Maybe this is a refresher, so let's learn a bit uh, concepts about uh, DRA's uh, initial implementation, which worked uh, in tandem with the scheduler. And uh, the interaction happened via a new new object called uh, pod scheduling context. Uh, DRA has or had uh, two modes, um, and uh, we'll go through that. So wait for first consumer mode. Um, we believe this mode uh, is a lazy mode. Um, so if you do not know what uh, resources your workload or pod needs a priori, um, then this is a useful mode. And uh, what, we, what we mean by that is, uh, let's try to understand this uh, with a use case. So consider technologies like uh, CXL, right? And these, these technologies help you attach resources that are not local to the node, and you can attach these resources on the fly uh, based upon what uh, uh, the requirement of a pod or a workload is. Uh, so certainly in those, those scenarios, uh, wait for first consumer uh, plays uh, a, a good role and is the mode uh, to be working with. Uh, the second mode is immediate mode. Um, this is much simpler and eager mode. Um, it does soft allocation per se, and uh, this allocation happens before the pod arrives in the system, um, in, in our scenario, or the system that we design. And we learn um, a bit more about soft allocation um, in the demo. Um, the reason immediate mode works for us is uh, most of our workloads are inference here in this cluster, and all they ask is GPUs or a mix slice. And and these are node local resources, and we know a priori um, uh, we can inspect them, and 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 we and we know what uh, the pod is requesting. So that's why, um, for our use case, uh, immediate mode uh, flies. Okay, so we saw two DRA modes. Uh, they both have overheads. So let's try to understand overhead between both the modes. Um, in wait for first consumer mode overhead comes from multiple interactions uh, between the controller and the scheduler um, via pod scheduling context. In immediate mode, we interact with the pod scheduling context just once. Um, you can see, as illustrated in the uh, workflow uh, chart, uh, the first picture here shows uh, wait for first consumer mode. Um, that does a back and forth um, with the scheduler and the DRA controller uh, to find a suitable node. While the second mode, which is the uh, second picture, which is the immediate mode, uh, 
just consumes the placement that is already existing in the system. So in comparison, immediate mode has less overhead. To enable immediate mode, placement and resource check becomes key to provide uh, valid allocations. Hence, uh, now further, since we have uh, talked about uh, placement as being important, um, let's, let's first define what do we mean by placement. Um, for our use case, placement is finding a node and a GPU and then provisioning a mix slice on that uh, uh, a GPU is what we define as placement. So with MIG enabled hardware, what we see is fragmentation is easy due to the constraints um, that it puts on. So the, the hardware has a constraint that vertical overlapping of slices uh, is, is not possible. On the contrary, if you do some sort of smart placement, it can help with fragmentation and optimize GPU utilization. Let's try to understand uh, this um, with an example. Assume you have a queue somewhere and you have two workloads requesting 3G slice and a 4G slice uh, in that particular order. Uh, according to uh, uh, the hardware's uh, supported uh, uh, dimensions, placing 4G slice ahead of 3G slice almost always makes sense. And that's a right to left placement uh, which we define in our system. To achieve such placement, uh, an external entity typically would be needed uh, that provides um, such better placement decisions and works with the existing queuing system uh, in the target environment. Hence, connecting the dot between our learnings and the use case, we now present another feature of InstaSlice, uh, the placement that works with the DRA controller via immediate claims. InstaSlice selection at this point is first fit algorithm. Placement of work, workload happens uh, right to left almost all the time for our use cases um, since uh, we are going after packing optimization. Future feature of InstaSlice would, would be to enable auto-scaling via possibly seeing pending claims uh, using machine sets, uh, which is an API provided by the cluster API project. Below picture shows the design and the interaction. So a high level overview would be InstaSlice controller sends placement information with claims to the DRA controller. DRA controller updates placements in its NAS object via immediate allocation. Cube scheduler reads the pod scheduling context to bind pods and finally workload starts running. InstaSlice also manages the life cycle of the claim with the workload, meaning if the workload is terminated or completed, InstaSlice would clean up the previous claim to make room for the next claim in the system. The whole setup has been running on OpenShift for us and we share with you a few pointers uh, on the installation process. We would like to thank uh, Vitaly from Red Hat for helping uh, with the enablement. We would also like to share a few gotchas that we encountered when building the system. To summarize, we faced hiccups with consistency, orchestration, and performance for our setup, um, and we list them out, so please reach out if you need more details on this. Okay, now the demo time. All right, uh, welcome to InstaSlice demo on OpenShift with uh, DRA enabled. Uh, let's quickly see the, the console URL and you see. Uh, oh. Okay. It's to the right. It's to the right.
All right, thank you for that. So what we see uh, in the cluster here is um, the cluster URL. Um, and once the cluster has been set up, we would also like to show uh, what operators we installed to enable DRA. Uh, so first, what we see is uh, the NFD operator, which is used to um, uh, label uh, accelerator-enabled nodes. And then the GPU operator is used to install GPU binaries uh, on the target nodes uh, in the cluster. Now we see uh, the number of nodes in the cluster. For this simple setup, we have single node OpenShift cluster, which operates as a control plane, master, and the worker. We see that the InstaSlice controller is, is running in the namespace InstaSlice system. And we also need the NVIDIA DRA driver. Now let's see the NAS object. Uh, for a clean slate cluster. Trust me, this works. This is a video, so I think it's a, a playback speed issue. So we see the NAS object here. Uh, the status here is ready. What we also see here is the MIG partition that is exposed by the NAS object for an A140 GB device. The interesting thing over here is this device has been managed by the NVIDIA DRA uh, plugin driver. And obviously, this is the node allocation state object or the NAS. Let's see if the cluster has any resource claims. Uh, so yes, we don't have any resource claims. So we start with clean slate. We submit a new kind of uh, first kind of resource claim, which is wait for first consumer claim. And it created a bunch of objects, uh, specifically GPU claim parameter that tries to acquire the GPU and make device claim parameter, which will uh, realize the MIG on the acquired GPU. Now remember, this, this, this mode is lazy, right? So we do want to see what's the status of the wait for first consumer uh, claim. So by this command, we would see the status uh, of the wait for first consumer's claim. And no surprises there. The state here is pending. And the reason being is there's no pod in the system, right? So it's lazy. It will do nothing. It just create the claim. OK, so let's verify this by now again reinspecting the NAS object. And we see that the NAS object at this point is just ready and it's clean slate. Okay. So hence we prove that wait for first consumer is, is la lazy according to our understanding. Now let's delete uh, the claim and start uh, with a clean slate system. Now here we submit something else. We submit here a regular pod or a workload and a bunch of things will happen. InstaSlice webhook will mutate the pod, will create the desired resource claims, and also provide placements. So let's see what kind of claims did InstaSlice controller create for this pod submission. So let's see. So we see now a different kind of claim that is created by the InstaSlice controller, which is immediate, and it's in the allocated state. OK, what about the placements, right? So you can see the placement. On, in the label section. So we have all the placement information in the label section, which is consumed by the DRA controller here uh, to make uh, the make placement on your target GPU. Let's see the NAS object now. Did it change? So NAS object now has two new sections, allocated claim, which we call as the intent, and prepared claims, which we call as the realization of the intent. So both of them are in sync. This just means that the partition has been created on the target GPU. Let's try to view the logs. What does the workload see? So no surprises there. We do see that the workload is seeing the correct GPU with the correct uh, mix slices. Now let's do something interesting. Let's submit few more workloads and see incremental mix creation happening in process. Uh, if we compare this with the device plugin world, uh, with, without any reconfiguration, this won't be possible. But uh, with DRA, this enables you. Um, let's again reinspect the NAS object now and see what happened when we submitted more workloads uh, to the system. What we now see is that the prepared claim sections has a lot more content, or meaning a lot more claims. And usually, the prepared claim se se section will play a catch-up game with the allocated claim section. Um, and, and, and soon after, they both would be in, in, in sync. 
let's see now what's the status of the resource claims. We do see that the resource claim now have been moved from allocated to reserved, meaning some of the pods in the system are, are consuming those immediate uh, resource claims. Let's do something more, more interesting now is try to incrementally delete pods, not claims. We are trying to delete workloads. And what Instasize Controller is doing is it has a relationship between workload to the claim. So it's trying to clean up the claim to make room for the newer claims. And if we see the resource claim now, we see that no resource claim exists because there are no workloads in the system. If we see the NAS object, the NAS object again is clean slate. So Instaslice manages the claim lifecycle with the workload. And in this demo, we show how Instaslice can influence decisions um, of the DRA controller. Okay. Okay. Um, to summarize, uh, DRA is the future, and it is still in progress. We have seen and learned that InstaSlice implements extended resources API on top of DRA, improves scheduling latency and placements by adopting immediate mode, provides placement from right to left. For initial DRA implementation, one key requirement what we observed is exposing an API, which could be consumed by external controller, like InstaSlice, to influence uh, DRA placement. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Um, thank you for listening. Be before we take questions, just a, a couple of comments on the demo you've seen here, right? So we have two demos here because the first one is just using plain Kubernetes and using the plain upstream DRA driver from NVIDIA. And you can find all the details, the scripts behind the demo on the InstaScale repository, and you can therefore not just you know, replay the demo at home, but you can recreate it at home if you want, uh, assuming you have A100 GPUs in, in your basement. Uh, call me if you do. Right. Um, as the second demo is an OpenShift demo. It shows more advanced features that require changes to the DA driver. These are things we're working on publishing with our colleagues at Red Hat, and it should be available shortly. Thanks. Uh, Yuan Chen from NVIDIA, yeah, Kevin Skolnick. So it's great to see the improvements and the enhancement in the mix. Uh, very nice work. So I just wondering, and uh, can you comment and compare the proposed dynamic and the slicing with other existing GPU sharing mechanism like time slicing and multi-process service? And uh, do you foresee and uh, any use cases in your practice for them? Thank you. Yes, of course. I, you know, uh, I don't want to give the misimpression here that we think that MIG is the one and only way to do slicing or sharing for inference. We choose to focus on MIG in this talk because it's really the poster child for DRA, but we're also considering time sharing MPS for inference, and we think that, you know, we probably even think that time sharing is, in the end, most likely more valuable than just MIG for inference. Okay, great. Look forward to see more use cases for all these. Thank you. Yeah, great presentation as well. Thanks a lot. I am curious, your cluster is a fixed size. Do you have any interoperability with node claims for? Um, yeah, currently in, in our scenario, we are working on, on fixed size clusters. I mean, I'm not sure if you're alluding to auto scaling. Uh, we yeah, I was thinking about Carpenter and node claims. Is there any interoperability between that and the GPU claims? The, I mean, the thing there is, I, I don't think Carpenter is there yet in understanding the dynamic claim creation and, and how, how the information gets propagated. We are in talks with the car, one of the Carpenter maintainers yesterday, okay. and, and there is work to do on understanding the mix. So right now, I think both the, not us, neither us nor them are, are ready, but we are in talks to, yeah. to make a I mean, It seems like there's some confusion between you're claiming a GPU on the one hand, 
the autoscaler is claiming a node on the other yeah. hand. Yeah. Yeah. How does that interoperate, I guess? is. Yeah, I mean, we, we need to figure a strategy out. Currently, we, we don't have one. Yeah. OK, yeah. thanks a lot. And uh, this is also something that the next revision of DRA with structure parameters should make it more uh, less opaque and therefore more amenable to have the autoscaler understand those things. Oh, yeah, yes. good point. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, hello, thank you for the talk. It was very inf informative. Uh, I wanted to ask, did I understand correctly that uh, InstaSwice is actually doing an injection, you might say, so a mutating webhook that would update the uh, information that you showed uh, uh, for the NVIDIA driver, which is yeah, very long and hard to understand? Yes, that's correct. That, that's what it does at, at this point in time. It's specific to the NVIDIA, you know, it essentially has a table that says, you know, this is what the slice is called. Um, uh, if you're using extended resources, this is what the profile names for the claims. This, this is the equivalent GPU parameter that you need if you're using the array. So it, it, it should be possible to extend. Uh, I think as I joked around also in the talk, I'm not convinced that long term, uh, you know, I don't want to convince my, my Red Hat colleagues that they want to deploy pod admission controllers on all their clusters. So I think we need better solutions. But, you know, that's a, at, at least that's a stopgap solution, and the point is we need this, right? We need this to be supported by the framework out of the box. Yeah, it's, it's a good idea, definitely, especially for someone that doesn't want to look into every tiny detail. But in the event that you do have to do some optimization to the NVIDIA one, does uh, InstaSwice allow it, like with some sort of annotation or...? Yeah, they, so I mean, from a code perspective, we are um, trying to open source the placement logic, and there is an interface. You can hook your custom policies on top of that interface and have your own custom placements, whatever you want. So that's that's in progress. We have, we have haven't released it because the new DRA version came in just yesterday or two days ago. So we are still in flux to to decide. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Adi Zaluk from Red Hat. Uh, so thank you for the great talk. So I, I saw you have webhooks, and the scheduler is now watching for new resources. Does this mean? So I want to understand first the impact of webhooks on this architecture. Second, if we need to extend the scheduler to watch for new resources apart from pods. No. Okay. Uh, and so. so uh, maybe this is a core DRA question. So DRA relies on extensions of the scheduler where it now understands claims. That is something they don't have if you don't enable the dynamic resource allocation feature on your scheduler. So there's definitely an underlying change in the scheduler uh, that is that we leverage here. So the first part of InstaSlice, the webhook, indeed is not changing anything in the scheduler. It's something that sits before the yeah. pod reaches the scheduler and make the necessary changes to your pod spec, essentially. OK, great. And then the you, second part, yeah. as you mentioned, ah, go ahead. I mean, you, you mentioned change in the scheduler. I mean, pod scheduling context is a new object that the scheduler consumes to get the placements. So that's that's a change implicit in the initial version of the DRA. And, and, and that's that was alpha feature upstream. So that's, that's the change for okay. the scheduler. All right. And, and then the second part is uh, you mentioned cluster API. I didn't get the context. Uh, so uh, auto scaling here, we are bouncing around ideas. Uh, you can so currently the autoscaler works on pending pods, but we believe autoscaling could also work on pending claims. Mm -hmm. And once you know the claims, then all you can do is you know bu bunch them together and ask for a node using the KP project, and then somehow stuff those claims on that node so that pods could you know attract to this node. And that could be one autoscaling policy. And the reason we say this is because I mean, if you go the traditional auto-scaling way, you would have to rebuild the binary for your own custom scheduler and other things. So it's a, it's a long path. So there are multiple solutions. It depends what you want to explore. All right. Thank you very much. Well, if there's no more questions, thanks again. Yeah. Thank you.